even if he does not. I'm still not going to see him. I'm still not going to buy him because he's worth it. Because deep down, even though there are times I forget who I am, luckily he never forgets me. And there are times when I want to give up. But the bottom line is the only way I can get up every morning and go through this is because of what Christ has already done. No circumstance will change who I am in Christ. I'll try. Sometimes it feels like it's going to win. Regardless of what we go through, is bigger for you. We have to believe that with all our hearts. Otherwise, what do we do? So I don't know where you're going through. Most of the people that I see that are standing in front of the fire have an aunt that has cancer. Right now. She gets it right now.
of the goodness of God. I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. Let's go, Lord. Father, as we gather here to this morning, Father, uh, it's good to be in your house. Father, would you remain? Father, it is my desire, Father, that your word speaks to us here this morning. Father, use Brother Andy. Father, as he's your mouthpiece here this morning as I step into your word. But Father, Moses, Moses outside of this wall. And Father, use him for what our desire. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord. My soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your When my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul sings your praise
at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all the sea how great how great is our God starts to pray, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life, break every strong Shine through the shadows, burn like the fire. Oh, and I just want to speak the name of Jesus. 
says it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. Amen. I come before you today. There's just one thing that I want to say.
Father, you do it in your time and not ours. Father, because so many times in my life, you would have given me what I wanted. I would have messed it all up. Father, I just lift Pam up to you as she comes to sing. Father, that you just use the words of this song. Father, the message of this song for your purpose, and your glory. And then, Father, I lift up my brother Andy to you as he stands in this pulpit. Father, that you would allow him to speak with boldness this morning. Father, that your word would go out. And Father, that we would be attentive. Father, that we would listen. Father, that Satan would be bound, and Father, there wouldn't be any distractions, but Father, Holy Spirit would rain down upon this place, and we would be changed this morning because we've encountered the living God. So in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Pam. Good word. All we see is a valley sometimes, but it's got mountains for us, doesn't it? Well, it's good to be here. You know, there's a lot of churches that you go in, they don't sing. They don't sit up front. They don't greet each other. They just go to church and leave. This church is different. You guys sing. You love each other. You can tell it. Encourage each other. Zoe's kind of wild sometimes, but but other than that, y'all do good. We dress the light. So, but uh, one thing I like about churches is when they greet you and when they welcome you. We have a dog, and I've told you this story before. And it's Bear. He's a little Shih Tzu, and, and if we're gone, I mean Becky will be gone. She'll go to the grocery store or something, and two or three blocks away, he'll see her car. He starts barking, running back and forth, and trying to figure out which door she's going to come in. And he'll run to the door. He wants to see her. Same thing with me. And that's the way a church ought to be. We ought to be excited to see one another. We ought to be excited to be in his house. Yeah. In the house of God. And that excitement should translate into the world around us. It should be where we want it, where God wants it to be is in the world out there. Not just in us, but in the world. We're living in a world right now that needs to see God more than ever. I'm telling you, our world is getting corrupt. It's, it's falling apart. But Christians need to be seen. Our That's voice right. needs to be heard. They need to see Christ in us wherever we go. Whether it's a grocery store or whether it's our family or whether it's our friends or whether it's at work or whatever it may be. You know, I go to football games or have gone to football games a lot or watched football on TV and everything. I watched it with friends and... and uh, I'm sort of a Dallas Cowboy fan, but they're kind of messing up now. But So I've kind of lost my, my uh, thrill for them, I guess. But, but used to, when they, man, they'd make a touchdown. Man, we'd all scream over, yeah! You know? and, uh, or you go to a football game and your team would make a touchdown or they'd make an interception. Everybody would get excited. People that you see in church would get excited, but you'd go to church and they wouldn't be excited. I think probably... If uh, Taylor Swift came in, people would get excited. I wouldn't. <laughs> but a lot of people would. Or some celebrity walks in. People would get excited. That's the way we need to be about God. About what he wants to do in our lives. Because we have the living God living within us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Just like he did in Jesus. Jesus was an all man, but he had the Holy Spirit living in him when he was walking on the earth. And he could go in the flesh or he could go in the spirit. And he went in the spirit. We have the same opportunity as Christians. That same Holy Spirit lives in us. We can make the same choices Jesus made. So we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. It's not very often that they do that in churches. But we're going to today. Especially Baptist churches. We'll be in Romans. All the scriptures will be up on the screen. I hope and I think they will. And uh, We'll be in Romans and Acts. We'll back up to Acts after we get through with Romans. But several scriptures in Romans chapter 8. The Holy Spirit. This is what we're talking about today. And there's a lot of scriptures I'm going to read, but I want you to listen real closely, okay? First one is Romans 8, 1 through 17. We'll start with 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you, what? Free from the law of sin and death. Let's stop right there just a minute. You've been set free from the law. You know, a lot of the Jews don't realize this. They still work in the law. There's a lot of denominations, a lot of churches that still work under the law. Have you ever heard somebody say to you, uh, well, do you know the Lord? You say, well, I hope so. They go, I hope so. It's not a hope-so salvation. It's a no-so salvation. Amen. We can know that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay? We can know that. So we're not under the law anymore. Although God wants us to obey the law, we're not under the law anymore. And a lot of the Jews don't understand it. A lot of Old Testament people, and even a lot of the churches. There's churches where you have to go to confession. You know what? You can go directly to Jesus. You don't have to go to a pastor or a priest. You can go directly to, to God now. When the curtain was torn in two in the Holy of Holies, that means 
Everybody can go in the presence of God. We don't have to go through a pastor or a priest. Everybody can go in the presence of God. And it's not through baptism. You know, border water will kill you. I'm from border. You can baptize somebody in border water, it might kill you. It won't save you. It, it, it might kill you. It might kill you. But it won't save you. It's just the act of receiving Christ, dying to yourself and being raised to be a new person. It's a picture of what God's already done in your life. It's not a works, okay? So the law is over. We want to obey the law, and God gave us the law to follow. But we live in the spirit of life now. Verse 3, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in his likeness of sinful flesh and as of an offering of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the, right, the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. When we received Jesus, it was fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. According to the Spirit. I believe that more Christians walk according to the Spirit, and I'm just as guilty as every Christian out there. Sometimes I get in the flesh, and I have to just slap myself, basically, and say, Lord, let me walk in the Spirit today. Let people see the Spirit of God in me today. In the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Verse 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their, what, minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. I believe I've talked about the mind in here when I talked about truth. Mind is Satan's playground. That's where he attacks us. He starts in the mind. It may be with lust. It may be with anger. It may be with gossip. It may be with several other things. But God starts there and we can let it go from our mind to our will to our emotions where it becomes a demonic stronghold in our life. Or we can stop it in the mind in the name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus. Stop it in the mind. I did a study on the mind and, and at least in the New American Standard there are 762 times that the mind is mentioned. And almost every time, Satan is involved in some way in the study of the mind. You might do a study on the mind sometime to see that. Verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God, even Christians. Do you know that? Christians that are walking in the flesh cannot please God. We have to be walking in the Spirit to please God. Verse 9. However, you are not the flesh, but the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Righteousness means right living. Living according to the Holy Spirit. According to the law that God has set down. Verse 11. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now think about that a minute. Think about that a minute. Stop right there. The spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. Do you know that same spirit is in you if you know Jesus? That raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. Amen. It's in you. It can raise us from the dead. Sometimes we walk in death. I believe it can literally like raise people from the dead. People that have died and people prayed over have been raised from the dead. I've seen God do miracles many times. But it's the Spirit of God who is in us. That's verse 13, or 11, excuse me. Go to verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under, under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Verse 13, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting the death to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, 
father. You've been adopted. You know, we have three adopted kids. Uh, grandkids. Grandkids. Three adopted grandkids. And they're, they're all of color, you know. And we love them to death. I mean, it's like they're from our own flesh and blood. I mean, we've known them since they were less than a year old, each one of them, pretty much. And, I mean, they're just like our own kids. I mean, we don't treat them any different than our grandkids that were born out of our blood. And that's how God sees us. We're adopted. We're his children. He doesn't look at color. He doesn't look at where you came from. He looks and says, that's my child. We're adopted. We are adopted. So we're in verse 14 now. 15. 16. Are we 16? Okay. 16. The Spirit himself testifies of our spirit that we are children of God. 17. And if children, heirs, also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, indeed, we suffer with him so that we may be glorified in him. This is not in past tense. We are with him. Yeah. I like to say we're co-resurrected, co-ascended, and co-seated in heavenly places with God. Did you know that? Co-resurrected, co-ascended, and co-seated with heavenly Father in heavenly places with God. That's where we are already. That's our home. You know, I, I told Becky not long ago, I said, you know, even though she grew up here in Tampa and I grew up in Border, this is our home area and all that stuff, but just the last couple of years, just had not felt like home. Have you felt that? This country hasn't felt like our home. This world hasn't felt like our home. It's like we're strangers almost. And I believe it is that way. I believe God's coming back soon. But he's going to bring revival before that happens. There's revival happening in colleges all over the United States right now. It needs to happen in churches, not just in colleges. The Holy Spirit needs to grab a hold of Christians in churches and bring revival to a town of Pampa. Pampa needs revival. Border needs revival. Our area needs revival. Our country needs revival. And God wants to bring revival to each one of us in our own hearts, in our own lives, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's move to Romans 16, 17 through 18. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eyes on those who cause dissension and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you've learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of many. Every church, not every church, but I don't know that this church does. Some churches do. Not all have antagonists in their church. Someone that wants to control the church. Uh, antagonists will come up to you and they'll say, it's not true in this church, but I remember a guy told me one time, He'd been a missionary overseas for 20 or 30 years. He's a great guy. I loved him to death. I'd gone on mission trips with him and stuff. But one time he told our staff, I think on Sunday mornings everybody needs to wear a tie. And this is in a staff meeting. And it was a new pastor. He'd only been there a few weeks. And he was kind of shocked to hear all this. And, and so uh, he said, why don't we take a break? And so I asked if anyone would go out. And I said, hey, can I talk to you? He said, sure. I said, he said, and also, he said, and we shouldn't sing choruses. Nobody likes them anyway. And so uh, we went out, and I said, I said, I won't call him by name, but I said, you know, the Bible says God looks in the heart, not the outward appearance. I doubt that Jesus would wear a tie on Sunday morning. I said, you wear a tie on Sunday morning, why don't you wear it on Sunday night? Why don't you wear it on Wednesday night? We're gathered. He says, we have a church. I said, God looks at your heart. I said, when it comes to courses and hymns, he says, sings hymns and songs and spiritual songs. Make a joyful Lord in the world. He said, use loud sounding cymbals. You know, a lot of people don't like instruments in their church, but the church was full of instruments. Leaders and guitar. And so a lot of times we have convictions that the Bible doesn't teach. Your conviction is not my conviction. But then there's certainties in the Bible. Certainties. The Bible says sing hymns and songs and spiritual songs. That's a certainty. You can know that because that's the truth. He says he looks on the heart, not the outward appearance. That's a certainty. We need to check our heart. Don't we? 
And so your, con your conviction may not be mine, but certainties should be all of ours. Certainties are Bible. Okay, they give Bible to you. And so we go on to verse 19. For the report of your obedience has reached all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, and I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent and what is evil. We need to be wise in what is evil, don't we? I'm convinced a lot of people don't even recognize evil today, even Christians. They don't recognize what evil is. We've got to be able to recognize evil. Verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. We have that ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to crush, for, to crush Satan under our feet. Y'all ever feel tempted? Have y'all ever feel fear in your life? Do you ever feel anger in your life? Do you, do you feel scared or something like that? That's Satan. And in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, he is defeated under your feet. You have that authority over him. Because you've been co-resurrected and co-ascended in heavenly places. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants us to do as Christians. He wants us to have hope and joy by the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to be powerful in our testimony. He wants us to be powerful in our relationships with our friends. Amen. And in our jobs. And in our families. You know, I was thinking the other day just about our family. And, and I got to thinking, you know, was, was I really the powerful dad I needed to be? Was I the loving dad I needed to be? Did I spend the time I needed to spend with my kids? And I ask myself even that about my grandkids and my great-grandkids. I want to spend more time and let them see Jesus in me. We've got a grandson coming for lunch who doesn't know Jesus today. I want him to see Jesus in me. I want him to see Jesus in me. And I hope it'll be powerful. I hope it'll be powerful. That's the way our lives ought to be. Powerful. They can see Jesus in us. I want to move to Acts chapter 1. Verse 8. But you will receive, what's that word? Power. There it is again. Do you feel powerful? I think a lot of Christians don't feel powerful. They feel defeated. God wants to give us power. Did you know that? I mean, I'm 74 almost. I should be walking around in the world. I don't know. But, but I told God, I said, I want you till I take my last breath, I want you to use me. Even if I'm laying in the bed like my mom was 94 the last year, as she told everybody that she met about me. I want it to be powerful. I need to be powerful. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, in, in Acts chapter 1, this is when the Holy Spirit came to Christians. Now, the Holy Spirit had been around. It had been in Moses and some other guys. And, and of course, Jesus before this time. Uh, and people were saved, but they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. But in Acts, the Holy Spirit came to the whole church. And at that time, I mean, God moved the day the Holy Spirit came. That church was speaking in, in languages nobody had heard before. And there, it says they were speaking, they were speaking and they were hearing everybody else's language. It wasn't just a tongue. It was hearing other languages. But God was moving. And now a lot of people think, well, I'm saved, but I don't have the Holy Spirit. No. When you receive Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. Now he's come. Amen. He's come. In fact, Jesus had told the disciples, wait, I don't want you to go yet. And the reason was the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. But when the Holy Spirit came upon them, then they could go and they could share. We have the Holy Spirit living in us now. When you receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in. We don't always avail ourselves of the Holy Spirit. We don't not always ask the Holy Spirit to move in us. We don't ever surrender to the Holy Spirit a lot of times like we should. But the Holy Spirit lives in us. It's power. The Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you and me. We've got the Holy Spirit living in us. Amen. Verse 32. 
And we are as witnesses of these things. And so the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. Those who obey Him. We've got to be in obedience for the Holy Spirit to work through us. Acts 7.51 says this. You men who are stiff-necked. Now, he's talking to the men. He really is. And I'm sure it, it means women too. But at this point, I believe it was men. Stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart. And ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your father did. A lot of men follow those laws. You know, if a dad will sing in church, the kids will sing in church. If they don't sing in church and they sit like this, the kids will sit like this and not sing in church. That's what he's saying here. Fathers need to be the leaders spiritually. They need to show the Holy Spirit in their life to their children and to their kids and to their family and to their workplace. Now, some of them are stiff-necked in heart and resisting the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Men should be the spiritual leaders in our church. I believe that's true here. There's a lot of men that are spiritual leaders in this church. Go to Acts 9, 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. When you have peace in your church and the Holy Spirit is moving, it brings increase. Most churches right now are not growing because a lot of churches do things in the flesh, not in the spirit. When we begin to do things in the spirit, it brings increase. I was in a church, got, got to baptize Becky's cousin uh, last week, was it? A week before last. And I mean, that church, whew, it's on fire. You can, you can just feel the Holy Spirit in that church. And I mean, they probably have 2,000 people. They have to have two-thirds. God's moving because of the Spirit's moving. And that's what God wants from us. Acts 9, 29 through 33 says, And now the Lord, take note of their, their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand and heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant. We prayed for healing, and we've seen people heal. Becky, my wife, and I have gone in the hospital. We've seen people with diseases they had no answers for. But when we prayed for them, they were healed. I've shared this, I believe, but we were in China. They hadn't had rain for three or four months. In this area where we went in China, in central China, it rained every day, all year long. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. It looks like Switzerland. Just a gorgeous place. But it hadn't rained for three months. And so we helped a guy water his field, his, his cotton, I mean his uh, tobacco field with bottles of water. And, and I said, can I pray with you? And he goes, sure. So I said, Lord, I pray there's rain. I pray you'll bring this gentleman rain in his field. And I got to share Christ with him. We went back that night to our little hotel. It wasn't much of a hotel. They never changed the sheets or anything. I mean, you know, never. And so he, we took our own things to throw on the bed. And uh, we went in this little area right down from where they ate outside the and we, we started singing, and we were going to pray for rain. And all this, these government officials came in, and they were asking the waitress, the waitress, what are they doing? And so she came in, and she said, what are y'all doing? Said, we're praying for rain. Now, normally I wouldn't say that in front of a government official, but I did. And she went back, she said, they're praying for rain. Those three government officials started laughing. They just started laughing. And within about five minutes, Becky said, Guys started pointing at them. It was like that. And they started, they quit laughing. And that morning it started pouring down rain. And we were there two weeks and it rained every day. We were there. And it rained from what we understand from people told us for a month after that. Every day. I believe in miracles. I believe God can use us in miracles. I really believe that. And we need, we need to say, Lord, use us. Use us. Man, that verse, I want to go back to 31 and stay right there. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. Hope God's shaking you today. 
was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. The church needs to be shaken and needs to be bold. I think the church is afraid to witness today. I've gone in churches, and I, I wouldn't ask anybody here, and I don't in churches most of the time, but I've gone in churches where I've been told they have maybe 100 people there, and they've never once led anybody to the Lord. I think the church would be embarrassed if we asked that question of all churches. How many of you have led somebody to the Lord and you only have one or two in a church? That's a shame. That's a shame. That's what we're called to do. That's our purpose is to tell people about Jesus Christ. They went out with boldness. Without boldness. Verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. That's why you don't want the antagonists in the church. You want to speak truth to them and say, listen, guys, we need to be one here. We don't need one person telling everybody what to do. We need to be one as a church. And they were of one heart and soul. Not one of them claimed anything belonging to them was their own. But all things were common property. And with great power, there's that, it, that word again, power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. With great power. Ask yourself, is this church powerful? Am I, as a part of this church, powerful? Why are we not powerful? Or why are we powerful? What's powerful about us and what's not? God wants to give the church power so that he can reach, we can reach the world. And if we've ever needed it before, we need it today. People need to know the Lord. They need to see the power of God in us. The power of God. When the Ark of the Covenant was, was brought into Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant was inside the tabernacle, the three parts of the tabernacle, the Holy place, the Holy of Holies was here. You had the outer court, the Holy place, and the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies, only the priest could go in. And they tied a rope around the priest's leg because if he'd had sin in his life and he went in the Holy of Holies, he died just like that. And they'd have to drag him out. And so it was a year each time before they had this, this celebration. And uh, so they, the priest would prepare himself because he didn't want to die in the Holy of Holies. Well, when Jesus rose from the grave, guess what? The curtain in the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom saying, we can enter into the Holy of Holies. You and me can enter into the Holy of Holies. Amen. We can go directly to God. And so, as the Ark of the Covenant would come through Jerusalem, they did this once a year, as I understand it. I've studied it. That they'd say, they'd have this celebration. And the congregation would speak all this. They had two priests. One priest would say one thing, and Alan's going to come up, come on up, Alan. And he's going to be the other priest or pastor, okay? He's going to be pastor two. I'm going to be pastor one. I'm going to be in the, the, the red. He's going to be in the green. And then when you see anything in the blue, you're going to say it. And this is what they'd say as the Ark of the Covenant came in. As really where the Holy Spirit was and what it represented. As it came in, they said this together as a church. So I want us to stand, all right? Stand up together. And this is mine, and then Alan's will be next. Here we go. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord and who may stand in the holy place? He who has a clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and all righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Let's say this together. Lift up your hands, okay? Sound it out. And be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. The priest, who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift your up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle, lift your heads, O gates, lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, 
the King of glory. Say, Lord, I pray today, King of glory, that you may come in here today. I believe you're already here. I believe you're already walking through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray churches will tune into the Holy Spirit, will learn how to personally seek you with all of their heart and not do anything in the flesh, but do it in the Spirit. Our world needs to see the church walking in the Spirit, moving in the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And I pray you'll do that in this church. I pray you'll do that in these people. I pray each one will ask themselves, am I walking in the Spirit or am I walking in the flesh? I believe most of us would have to say most of the time we're walking in the flesh. Lord, help us to walk in the Spirit. That people around us will see God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, if they've never received you and come in their heart, you say in your word, as many as receive you, to them you give the gift to become the children of God. We can't earn it. It's a gift. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. If there's one here today that's never come to you to receive you as Lord and Savior, I pray right now where they're standing. And say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I want the power of the Holy Spirit to come into me and save me and make me a different person. Maybe we're standing here today and we said, man, we work in the flesh way too long. It's time to say, Holy Spirit, move on me in such a way that I'm powerful, that I change the world around me. Lord, I pray you move in our hearts today as we sing. I pray we'll sing with all of our heart. And if we need to move, if we need to make a decision, then we'll do that. We'll not be a shy person. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll do this in Jesus' name. Let's sing this together. Lift up your voices. Savior is if we just open our eyes, we'd see the miracles that he's already doing. And if we surrender, he would work through us and we'd see even more. Such team, five o'clock. Let's pray. Father, I come to you now, Father, and I, I pray for that boldness that Peter prayed for during that. Father, that despite what's going on in the world around us, despite that we might be persecuted, despite, Father, that we might be rejected, Father, that we would speak with boldness. We'd speak with boldness the hope that is found in Jesus, that is found nowhere else. Father, we'll celebrate a sports team. Father, we'll shout our political affiliations. Father, help us to shout about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the only one that's going to make a difference. And Father, I do pray for revival. 
Father, that you would send revival upon this church. Yes, Lord. And Father, I, I, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move in such a way, Father, that it would be a movement of the Holy Spirit I haven't seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Father, I, I do believe that you're at the door. Mm -hmm. And Father, you're just waiting. Father, for us to surrender to you. So help us to surrender.